Hello everyone, my name is Anthony Shivkumar and welcome to uh, this episode on bandwidth. And in this video, I'm going to explain to you what exactly is a bandwidth and why we should even be concerned about a bandwidth and how does it apply to signal integrity. So let's get started. <clears throat> so before I run any simulation on what bandwidth is and uh, how it really works, I just want to basically, you know, point out that, you know, a lot of the information that I'm getting right now um, is basically from uh, this particular book called uh, Signal and Power Integrity Simplified by Eric Bogatin. Um, if you haven't read this book um, and you're dwelling into signal integrity, um, it's something that um, uh, has I've been reading and practicing and it's uh, uh, helping me learn a lot. And in one of uh, the, the chapters in this book, he talks about bandwidth. And in simple English, a bandwidth of a square wave is nothing but uh, the, the, the frequency components that can make up the square wave. So um, in here, I actually have uh, something from Wolfram Math, Math World where you can really go over there and say, what's, this, what's the frequency response of a square wave? And what this really does is it takes a square wave and it says, um, basically what a Fourier transform does is what all sine, com sine wave components make up the, say, the square wave? Um, and you'll have a fundamental frequency, which is basically the clock frequency. And, and this square wave uh, arises a lot in digital electronics. It'll apply, it'll, you, if you, you know, look at a logic analyzer, you'll see this in your clocks, you will see this in your SPI bus, in your I square C uh, bus, you know, wherever there's, a, it's all clock, you know, logic, logic gates is all about clock. And here you can see that it's made up, it's made up of a couple of, um, uh, sinusoidal waves and the Fourier transform basically allows us to figure out what all sinusoidal waves with the amplitude and the frequency can make up this particular square wave. And that's really an, in a nutshell uh, what you do when you're basically uh, trying to figure out what the uh, frequency components of um, a signal is, is basically saying what are all the uh, sine waves that make up the signal and you can do this through uh, the Fourier transform. So why is this important and what does this really relate to? Uh, one thing you'll notice that and why we're trying to do this is because uh, I want to show you that or rather what um, in, in the book Signal and in, in Power Integrity, it basically tries to tell you that uh, your, com your, your waves or your, the speed of the signal is not really as important as a very specific parameter of uh, the square wave. And what we're going to show you is that this bandwidth is related to the rise time. And now rise time is everything when it relates to bandwidth. And that's really what the simulations that I've been basically trying to conduct on to show you that if you uh, decrease the rise time, uh, the bandwidth of the signal actually increases. It has got more frequency components and it also uh, can, you know, cause uh, switching noises, harmonic noises and all the things that come with it uh, because it's got a higher bandwidth. So in a nutshell, uh, what exactly uh, is uh, a bandwidth? So in one of these um, lecture slides I actually have over here, which is just taken from the book itself, uh, is basically saying that the bandwidth is uh, 0.35 the rise time. So if you have a rise time, um, then it would be uh, 0.35 divided by rise time, you will get the bandwidth. Or you could also say that the rise time is 7% of your uh, clock frequency. Um, so in this particular case, it's 0 0.07 uh, multiplied by the time, uh, the period of your clock or, or divided by the clock frequency. And you can also think of bandwidth as 0 0.35 divided by 0 0.07 into F frequency of the clock or the fifth harmonic of the clock. All right, so it's basically five times the clock. So the fifth harmonic is basically a bandwidth of your clock. So let's try to make sense of all of this uh, shortly. So what I'm going to do is I am going to go to ADS. And in here, I have three different signals. Okay, I have exactly the same square wave. Okay, I just have exactly the same, same square wave. And what I'm trying to show you out here is that uh, we're not really looking at the square wave. We're looking at the rise time and the edge of the rise time and the fall time because that's where the real magic or the real... Um, differences between the same frequency, 
but the rise time makes the difference as to what the bandwidth of the signal is. So I have a VPR, VR um, um, BSS uh, signal generator, which is nothing but a pulse generator. And uh, all I'm trying to do is measure the output of this of this of this um, of this uh, source. And <clears throat> I just have a high value resistor to basically simulate its open circuit because if I don't, then it will give me an error. So I have three different types of signals out here, uh, same types of signal, but three different models. And what are the difference in the model? So one is uh, got a head shape of linear transition and, and I'll show you what that linear transition is uh, when we do the simulation. The second one has a, a cosine transition and the third one has a function transition. So they all have the same frequency. Uh, they all have the same form of rise time as well, but they have a different edge rate if you, if you want to go that route. Okay, um, here I have, and what in here what I have is some computations that's happening. So there are two different things in, in ADS. Uh, I'm using uh, Keysight ADS for this. Uh, one is the, um, there are variables that are basically computed before uh, the simulation takes place. And then there are variables and then there are equations that are calculated after the simulation takes place. Basically you get the value from um, the simulation and then uh, it hap and then this is calculated after. Uh, but nevertheless, it all happens as soon as you basically click the um, uh, simulate button. So what I have over here is uh, because this is in the time domain, I need to convert this into the frequency domain. So I'm using a function called FS, uh, and I believe it's called frequency spectrum. Um, and it all it basically under the hood, I would think it's doing some form of an FFT and is giving you the frequency components of uh, the square wave. So I have the square wave over here. VCOS and VRF, and I'm basically trying to create the frequency components uh, of those waves. So once you simulate the circuit, then we want to calculate the frequency components of the wave. And in here, we have basically what is the, um, there's also in, a, in, a, in, a, in an easy way, uh, you can also calculate the, um, um, in, a, in, a, in a very, you know, um, in a linear regression way, you can calculate the slope of the bandwidth and it's basically two divided by pi into the frequency that um, frequency of the uh, frequency that you're basically trying to calculate at that instance uh, divided by the frequency of the clock. And that's basically what this A over here is. And what is the frequency of the clock? It's it's nothing but um, in this particular case, I have my BR, which is the bit rate, which is the speed of the, of the clock, which is 0 0.2. And if you want to convert this bit rate into the frequency, um, because it's gigabits per second, you have to basically divide it by 10 raised to nine. Um, uh, so you have to multiply it by 10 raised to nine because it's giga, uh, and that'll give you the frequency. And why you divide it by two, and the reason being is divided by two is because when you look at a clock, if I double click on the clock over here, there's always going to be a high and then there's going to be a low. So in one, um, in one clock cycle, you'll have basically, um, one bit high and you know one one high and one low so you're just dividing it by two uh to basically just click off by, by by base to basically get the the how frequently the pulse is basically uh, generated and that's really it so so let's uh so yeah so this because it's one zero one zero one zero uh you are you just want to divide it by two so that you'll just get basically one instance of that bit to uh and then that and that will give you the clock frequency basically okay and uh, and now we'll do the simulation. So I've already simulated. Uh, the reason being why I pre-simulated is because generally when I'm doing uh, video recording, uh, my computer with all the simulations can be a little um, slow. Um, so nevertheless, so here we have the three different simulations. So let's go from bottom to on top. So I'm just going to go to I'm just going to zoom in, and then we'll try to analyze the the, the the results you know step by step so what i have here is basically a square wave uh, and to make it look a little bit better what i'm going to do is put a 1.1 over here um, so now you can see the square wave i can do the same thing for all of this so one thing with ads if you want to change the scaling of your of your thing just enter the number and all of a sudden uh it'll automatically uh scale for you accordingly uh and it'll give you the nice graph so this is the pulse that we're generating and they're all similar in terms of, you know, the rise time 
and the fall time. They, they are basically f- supposed to fall at one nanosecond. That's the, it'll take one nanosecond for it to go from a high to a low. So that's why there's a small little edge. And we're looking at this in my nanoseconds. And they're all very similar in that sense, at least from this bottom graph. Um, so there's no difference if you look at it from the bottom graph. So they're very similar. So let's go one step and analyze just how, just go into detail as to find this graph. So I'm taking the same graph that's there in the below, and I'm basically instead of going from zero to hundred, I'm going to scale it from zero to 10. And the cool part about ADS is it'll automatically scale the graph for you. So it's, you know, it just does this thing automatically. And now let's look at the graph. So now they're both, now they're all the, the graphs, which is the, the square wave or the linear, the linear transition, which is going from high to low linearly. This is basically having an error function, which is more realistic in the real world, and the cosine function, which is also very similar to the ERF, but this, but it's more linear than 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 and and a little and less curvy on the top. So I'm just basically zooming in on this to see how the rise time or the fall time is, and this will give a good indication as to uh, you know what's really happening at that edge, and you can see they're slightly different. And that's why it's important to see this because once you zoom in, this is where the frequency components of these three do they're exactly the same clock frequency. They have the same, from a high level, they look exactly the same. But as you start to zoom in, you'll realize that the edge uh, is communicating a lot more. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you think you can omit it, it's not a good idea. And by understanding this edge, we can get a lot, of, we can get a lot more information as to what's really happening to this clock signal. And here we've taken the clock frequency. Now the clock frequency into the is is, is not clock frequency the frequency component of this clock, and here you can see the difference between the frequency component of this clock, this clock, and this clock. The one is the linear linear uh, falling edge. One is the um, more of a uh, Gauss. I believe it's a it's an integral of a Gaussian uh, um, curve, and this is a a cosine curve kind of. So if you look at all these three different graphs uh, or these three different edges and look at their bandwidth components. So the first component will be the frequency of the clock, which is going to be at 10 raised to 8, um, 100 megahertz. Um, the first frequency component of, uh, of the clock. And that will be the fundamental frequency because that's the frequency of the clock. And then you can basically see that the second component because it's a square wave uh it'll only have i believe all the odd harmonics um uh, but let's not get it more into that um we look in more into the, you know how the uh, uh frequency components and the magnitude of the wave is and as you can see the more the linear it is it's got a lot more it's got a uh, as the frequency increases it's still got a lot of uh, components harmonic components to it now of course after 10 raised so this is 0 10 raised to minus uh, so this is 0. Uh, uh, 0.7 uh, 10 um, 7 into 10 raised to minus 1 so it'll be uh, 0. 0.7 uh, this will be 0. 0.1 this is the magnitude this is going to be 0. 0.01 0. 0.001 so as you see that the magnitude is automatically decreasing quite significantly so yes though there's a lot a lot more uh, frequency components uh, in the higher end, uh, the magnitude is very small, so you can kind of omit it. And then when you look at the one which is uh, a little bit more um, smoother, you can see that the frequency component is very similar to the first one, and it's much more distinct, but it dies off very, very quickly, which is much more cleaner, much more smoother in terms of figuring out what the frequency component of this particular edge compared to this particular edge. And similarly for your, this is also a lot smoother and cleaner compared to uh, the first graph, which is a very linear graph. Um, and you can see that the one with the errors, with the error cosine, with the error um, integral of the Gaussian function is a lot more smoother in terms of the frequency components of the curve of the, of the signal compared to uh, the other two graphs. And this is what the bandwidth of the signal is, uh, you know, um, in a high level, um, you can see the bang of the signal is five times the fundamental frequency. So we can say, you know, one, two, three, four, five. So till the fifth, fifth till the fifth one, which is a uh, 900 megahertz. Uh, and here you can say one, two, three, four, five. 
uh, maybe you know this is going to be till uh, 1 1.3 gigahertz so the higher the bandwidth of the signal it just means it's got more uh, noise components to the signal you don't want too many noise components you don't want the signal to be too noisy and this could also be one two three four five and here you got this still uh 1.1 gigahertz right so is giving a higher level overview that uh this signal is a lot more cleaner uh because the curve is not too um, linear dropped it is a it's a slowly degrading it's still very fast it's still one nanosecond but the graph of this will be um, a lot a lot less so let's do one simulation and i will try to decrease the, the let's let's have this graph over here and i'm just going to do a simulation where um uh, what i'm going to do is try to minimize this we just try to take i think 1.3 might work may work so this was one nanosecond from five to six. Uh, here we're trying to basically now increase it by, uh, it'll, it'll take a little longer to reach the, uh, so it'll take 1.3 times in order for it to reach the uh, falling edge. Yeah, and there we go. And so it's gone from five to six point something, so a little bit 1.3. And then you can see it's starting to get a little smoother. These graphs are now starting to get a little smoother uh, because as I make this a lot more smoother, a lot more slower, uh, the 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 um, uh, the bandwidth of the signal will decrease, and that's a good thing. So we want to have a smaller bandwidth because then it would be uh, less susceptible to higher, you know, to harmonics and uh, higher frequency components, and those are not good things. Um, so yeah, that's really what I wanted to show you as to why everything in sin signal integrity is is related to uh, bandwidth and bandwidth is nothing but related to the rise time. And without knowing the rise time, you wouldn't know the bandwidth of the signal. And it doesn't matter whether it's the clock frequency the same or not, it's all about the rise time. And once we understand what the rise time is, we realize a lot of signal integrity issues um, when, we're when we're designing PCBs. Uh, it's important to know okay if this is the rise time of my of my signal how am i going to make sure that all these components um, and the noise that is created how can i suppress it by adding you know certain certain elements that can suppress all these noise and that's really what we're trying to do over here all right so i hope it's helpful i try to you know give a more mathematical perspective of uh, what's really happening under the hood that's something that i myself am studying to better understand and improve my PCB design tools. I am trying to invest a little bit more into uh, some of these equipments so that I can actually conduct some of these experiments in, in, in the real world. So yeah, keep posts, uh, you know, subscribe to this, uh, to this YouTube channel, like the video because there's gonna be a lot of this type of uh, analysis that's gonna happen. And I'm super excited uh, to share it with you guys. Thank you so much.